Welcome to today's web chat about male fertility. Thank you for joining us. My name is Ed Bottomley with the Michigan Medicine Department of Communication. One in eight couples have trouble getting pregnant or sustaining a pregnancy. Infertility is not an inconvenience, it's a disease of the reproductive system that impairs the body's ability to perform the basic function of reproduction. Our goal today is to provide helpful information for individuals and couples who are trying to conceive and answer any questions on male fertility. We know there's no shortage of advice from well-intentioned friends and family members, not to mention the internet. So we're also ready to do some myth busting today and to help you sort out the myths from the truth. So we'll introduce our panelists in a moment, but first just a few housekeeping items. You can submit your questions at any time, even now, for our panelists to answer during the Q&A portion of today's chat. Questions can be submitted by commenting on this video, but please note that if you do so, your name and profile name will be visible to others participating. If you prefer a more anonymous option, uh, you can always send a private message to us via Facebook or email at ask-mishmed at med.umish.edu. If you stay for the whole chat or want to share the recording with a friend, sorry, if you can't stay for the whole chat or want to share a recording with a friend, a video of this chat in its entirety will be available shortly after our Facebook broadcast. And we're also going to post to the Michigan Medicine YouTube channel shortly after too. So now to our panelist. Uh, Dr. Jim Dupree is a urologist at Michigan Medicine. Dr. Dupree received his medical and master of public health degrees from Northwestern University in Chicago, Illinois. He completed his urology internship and residency at Northwestern and an advanced fellowship in male reproductive medicine and surgery at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. Dr. Dupree, you specialize in the advanced treatment of male infertility as well as testing and treating low testosterone and erectile dysfunction. So, Thank you again for joining us and thank you for joining us. Dr. Dupree, let's jump right in to the topic of male fertility. Can you share with us some of the basic challenges related to male fertility that can affect the ability to have children? Sure, Ed, and thanks so much for organizing this and putting this together. Um, as you said earlier, male infertility is a very important topic, uh, one where there is a lot of well-intentioned advice that's out there and it's useful to give folks an opportunity to ask questions and so we certainly hope uh, that you do today. Um, some of the basic challenges um, that, that men might encounter when they're experiencing infertility fall into a couple really broad categories. Uh, so one of the things that um, might be causing infertility for men are hormonal issues. And so when we uh, uh, evaluate and see a man to talk about fertility, we'll often do some blood testing to check for hormonal issues. Some men might have uh, what we call anatomic issues, meaning uh, basically that there is something uh, wrong or different with the normal structure and function of the parts of the male reproductive system. Um, and we, uh, as well, talk with men and evaluate men for those when they come in. Uh, in some cases, there are lifestyle issues that might be causing infertility in a man, such as uh, smoking, cigarettes, tobacco, marijuana, um, or spending a lot of time in a hot tub, for example. Um, and in some cases, there can be uh, either infections that men have had in the past or genetic issues that can also cause infertility in men. Fantastic. Thank you for that overview. So what we'll do now is we're going to open up the floor for questions. Uh, one more reminder to our audience that you can submit questions by commenting on the video directly. You can direct message us on Facebook. You can email us at ask-mishmed at med.umish.edu. We won't use your name when we read off your question, but do know that if you comment directly on this video, your name and your profile name will be visible to other participants. So let's kick things off. Great. Our first question for you, Dr. Dupree, how do you test for male infertility? Sure, yeah, that's a really common question. Um, <clears throat> and I think a lot of guys uh, are probably a little bit nervous because they don't really know what to expect, and so I really appreciate you, know, you asking that question today. Um, so uh, the good news is that the testing and evaluation for a man for infertility uh, is, is really pretty painless. Um, a big part of the testing and evaluation is a visit, a visit with a urologist or a male fertility specialist, someone like me or my partners here at the University of Michigan or others throughout the country. Um, it really starts with a conversation, a conversation to ask about how long someone has had infertility, what medical issues they may have, surgeries that they've had in the past. So it's really just a discussion of sort of what brought them there and learning more about them and their medical history. Uh, we do ask questions as well about their reproductive history, so how long the man and his partner have been trying for a pregnancy, have they had any pregnancies in the past, 
Um, we do a physical exam. The physical exam, just like any other doctor that might come to visit, uh, for other reasons. Um, so things that we examine uh, during a male fertility evaluation are the parts of the male anatomy that are relevant. So it's an examination of the penis, the testicles, very rarely a prostate exam as well. Um, all done in the privacy of the office, um, you know, with the doctor. With the doctor. Um, in addition to the history and the examination, uh, we generally do a blood test that can use, all be done from sort of one poke of the veins to draw the hormones that we need to evaluate. And then an important part as well is a semen analysis. So for a semen analysis, a man is given a, a specimen cup and either in the privacy of his own home or in the privacy of the collection group in our laboratory, he masturbates and provides a semen sample for us to evaluate. Um, some guys might find that a little bit odd, but the way I always explain it is that if someone has a blood problem, we do a blood test. Mm -hmm. If someone has a urine problem, we do a urine test. If someone might have a fertility problem, we do a semen test. It's just another part of the body that we evaluate. Great, and that, that brings me on to my second question. How common is male infertility? Sure, it's more common, I think, than most people think. <clears throat> um, so I'm glad that someone asked that question as well. Um, among all of the sort of reproductive age men in the United States, we think somewhere around probably 9 or 10% of men are experiencing infertility, meaning that they and their partners have been trying for usually about a year or more um, of having regular unprotected intercourse without having a child, without having a pregnancy. Um, when you look at all of the couples that come in to an office to be evaluated for fertility issues, um, about half the time, uh, the male partner, something about his reproductive health is contributing to their problems getting pregnant. Okay, and does infertility only affect older men? Not at all, no. So infertility can affect men really of any age. Um, some uh, men are, um, you know, certainly men that are trying to conceive at a younger age might notice or diagnose it. Um, we do think that um, it's sort of, I think, well known in the culture that, uh, that women have what are often is called like a biological clock, like mm -hmm. a fertility window for women where they are most able to get pregnant. Um, men don't have a sort of strict biological clock in the same sense, but we do think that as men get into their you know, 60s and 70s that their sperm quality and their sperm count does start to go down or decline. Um, but there's really no age range where a man you know, can be sure that he doesn't have infertility or where he would think that he absolutely would have infertility. It really can happen to all men of all ages. Thank you for that. Our next question, um, and I think you almost answered this one a little bit, does a man's age affect the quality and quantity of his sperm? So um, when uh, men are first born, when boys and children are first born, they're not making any sperm at all. Right. And so when a man goes through puberty or a boy goes through puberty, he starts to make sperm. And once he's finished with puberty, which in different you know, men or young men, you know, somewhere in the teenage years, um, he will be making a, hopefully a normal amount of sperm. And then that amount of sperm should stay about the same probably until his 50s or 60s, I would think. Um, in terms of the quality of the sperm, again, we think that um, there's still more research to be done, but it's likely that as men get into their older years, 50s, 60s, 70s, that there is some decline in sperm quality. But there are plenty of examples, and I'm sure many of you have heard or seen them, where um, a man can certainly still father children well into his 50s, 60s, 70s or more. My next question for you, uh, I'm a 32-year-old woman married to a 57-year-old male. I've heard that men who are older have higher rates of birth defects in their children. Is this true? So that's a, um, it's a really important question, but uh, also a little bit of a complicated one. So um, as I mentioned earlier, men can have men may have a decline in their sperm quality just associated with getting older, with being older. Uh, when researchers have done studies to look at sort of large groups or large populations of men where the father is of different ages, they do see um, some slight increases in the risks of some genetic issues or um, genetic birth defects in the children that are born if the man is sort of in his older years. Now, those birth defects rate are still overall low. So it's not a guarantee that a man who's 57 is going to have birth defects in the child or any problems with the offspring, but compared to younger men, the risk might be slightly higher. Um, these aren't the exact numbers, but I think a useful way to think about it is that if something were to normally happen one out of every 1,000 times, but now it starts to happen two out of every 1,000 times, it still happens very rarely, but you might think of it as saying, oh, it happens twice as much, but it's still quite rare. It's a nice perspective on that. Um, the next question we have uh, coming in, 
We are in the middle of male factor infertility treatment and have been told ICIS is our best option for conceiving. My husband's count is under a million. Is there any chance we could try the less expensive IUI option or is it not worth the time, trouble, money? Sure. Um, well, you know, for whomever asked that question, it sounds like you have already a, a good relationship with your physician and I would obviously encourage you to make sure that you ask your physician that same question. Um, my perspective um, is one that, um, uh, and for those that don't know what ICSI means, it stands for intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Uh, it's a particular form of IVF uh, that's actually very, very useful when a man has a low sperm count. What they do in ICSI procedures is they take individual sperm and they inject them directly into individual eggs so that a couple can still go through IVF together even if the man's sperm count is very low. And so it's a, it's a technique that's been around for the past several years and has really opened up the door for a lot of men and partners to go through IVF that otherwise wouldn't have. So it's a really, really useful um, technique and technology that's here. The specific question is about, well, what do you do if you have a low sperm count? And, um, you know, in medicine, we, you know, we all sort of learn to be humble, to sort of never say never or never say always. Um, but for a man whose sperm count is down around a million, it's pretty unlikely that IUI, which stands for intrauterine insemination, will result in a pregnancy. Um, when they've done research and studies on um, how successful IUI will be, and look at men of different sperm counts and look at how successful IUI is, most of the time uh, sperm counts below, depending on the research, five to 10 million, show that IUI really isn't very successful. And so that's what I tell my patients, is that below that sperm counts in that range, IUI is uh, unlikely to be successful. Thank you for that. We, I'm happy we're getting quite a few questions coming in. Great, yeah. Are there any supplements you recommend to boost count, motility, morphology? Sure. Um, probably the most important supplement that people can have is just a good diet. And maybe that's not exactly a formal supplement, but I always tell people that a healthy, balanced diet is really all the nutrition that you need for a good sperm count and good sperm production and quality of the sperm. In particular, I encourage guys to eat plenty of green leafy vegetables. They're very high in antioxidants. Um, and the antioxidants are chemicals that can help reduce inflammatory um, things that are in the semen and might be damaging the sperm. For guys, uh, when they've done research on uh, supplements, um, admittedly, the research is pretty mixed. Some of the studies suggest that there are supplements that might make slight improvements to sperm quality or sperm count or movement. Um, other studies suggest that they're isn't much of a difference. Um, what I tell men is that if they really want to do something extra to sort of help um, maybe improve their sperm count or sperm movement in addition to having a healthy lifestyle, um, there's three things that I recommend to guys. Vitamin C, zinc, and coenzyme Q10. But again, I don't sort of push those upon my patients. I tell them that um, it's an option that's out there that the research suggests, if anything, those are the three that might have some benefit. Thank you for that. Uh, next question, once my sperm count goes low, can it come back up? Yeah, so this is a really, uh, a really surprising thing for, for guys to learn, I think, is that there can be a lot of variation in a sperm count um, from one day to another in a guy, from one month, from one season, or even from one year to year. And so when we do sperm testing for men, we uh, generally try and get at least two samples because we know there can be a lot of change or difference from one sample to the other. So the short answer is yes, the sperm count, once it's low, can go back up. Sometimes it goes back up on its own. Okay. If during the evaluation we find that there's a hormone problem or a blood drainage, a vein problem, or some blockage problem, and the patient receives treatments, medicines, or surgeries, those things can also help make the sperm count go back up. Okay. Next topic we're going to tackle, yeah. uh, vasectomy. Great. I've had a vasectomy, is it reversible? If so, how soon will I start producing sperm in my semen? Sure, so uh, vasectomies are really commonly done. They're probably one of the most common procedures that urologists do for patients around the country. Um, research would suggest that probably around 5% of men after they have a vasectomy might have desires for children later in life. So this is a pretty common question given how often we do vasectomies. Yeah. Um, vasectomies can be reversed. Um, when a couple has, uh, uh, is interested in children and the male partner has had a vasectomy, there's really two main routes for a pregnancy. One is with a vasectomy reversal. The other is with IVF. Either way, the man gets a procedure. Um, 
and in, we can talk a bit more about the vasectomy reversal surgery if there's additional questions or patients want. But um, um, the question about how quickly it returns the sperm comes into the semen, the good news is that the testicles are still making plenty of sperm even when a man has had a vasectomy. So the production never really gets turned off. It's just that there's a blockage of the flow of the semen. After the vasectomy reversal surgery, usually around six to eight weeks afterwards, we hope by then that the inflammation from the surgery has gone down and there's sperm that would now be in the semen. Great, and our next question is re with regards to, uh, I've had a vasectomy, is it reversible? And f a follow-up, if so, how soon will I start producing sperm in my semen? And then what is the difference between vasectomy reversal and sperm retrieval? How do I decide between reversal and retrieval? Sure. So. The probably most important thing for you to decide if, um, you know, for those of you out there that are thinking about this is, uh, again, to have a, a consultation session um, with both a urologist, someone that is trained to know how to do a vasectomy reversal, and also to meet with a reproductive endocrinologist, which is a gynecologist who has done extra training for the female side of fertility, and really to meet with both and get consultations for both. The main difference is that, um, is really about sort of how the, the, how the child, how the conception were to occur. So in a vasectomy reversal surgery, uh, surgery that I commonly do as well as several of my partners here and again others around the country, um, we use a microscope to magnify our view of the vas deferens. We use very tiny little sutures to sew those cut ends of the vas deferens back together to allow the sperm to be traveling through. So that sperm would travel through the vas deferens and a man would have sperm in his ejaculate just like he would have hopefully had before his vasectomy. At that point forward, Pregnancy is just about having you know, regular intercourse and getting conceived sort of the old-fashioned way, so mm -hmm. to speak. Uh, the sperm retrieval procedure is one that's used as part of IVF. And so in that procedure, uh, a man, we use numbing medicine to the scrotum, and we use a small needle to pull t sperm directly out of the testicle or a gland called the epididymis. It's on the back side of the testicle. We hand those sperm over to the uh, IVF professionals in the laboratory where they use those sperm and combine them with the eggs from the woman for an IVF procedure. Thank you for that answer. Uh, next question, my wife and I saw a fertility specialist who said we needed artificial inseminations because of my sperm. Can you explain what actually happens when you do this procedure? Sure, so the artificial insemination procedure also goes by the name uh, intrauterine insemination or IUI, so you may see that out there on websites that you read or booklets that you may come across. So during the artificial insemination procedure, the way I explain it to patients is that the sperm and the egg, they still meet and find each other the old-fashioned way inside the uterus or the fallopian tubes. Your doctors should sort of help the sperm along. And so typically the female partner will be uh, monitored by her doctor and her ovulation cycle will be sort of monitored and then predicted as to when she's about to ovulate. Sometimes that's with the assistance of medications, sometimes not. And then on a day that she is ovulating or about to ovulate, uh, both partners usually come into the clinic together. The male partner provides a semen sample just like he would do for any of the testing that we use. In the laboratory, the uh, professionals there take that semen sample, they wash and they concentrate the sperm, and then they give it to his female partner's doctor. Uh, that doctor does basically a pelvic exam for the female partner and puts a very small little catheter up through the cervix into the uterus and then pushes those sperm through that catheter to be deposited directly in the uterus. The sperm are then free to swim around and find the egg, again, kind of the old-fashioned way as they used to. Great. The next question, uh, this, is a, this is quite an interesting one. My husband and I saw a fertility doctor who said we needed IVF. My husband is really uncomfortable with doing IVF because it's not the natural way. The natural way. We've been trying for over two years and I'm getting desperate. Do you have any advice on how to get him on board? Sure. Um, you know, in terms of getting your, 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 your husband or male partner on board for IVF, um, probably one of the big things to do is make sure that, you know, he's had a chance to see a urologist himself, um, a fertility specialist himself. Sometimes it can be useful for uh, him to have a doctor of his own to sit down and talk with, to ask his own questions either, you know, with his wife there or not, um, and make sure that he has a full understanding of what the procedure is involved and, and why it's, you know, going to be the next best step for them. Um, 
infertility can be really, really challenging for couples. Um, and it's something that others may have questions about too. And it's really common for this to be kind of a very, you know, stressful and heavy time for people. Um, if you're finding it difficult to kind of talk with your husband about some of the recommended procedures or medicines that are next, a lot of clinics also have like a social worker or a counselor who's there, or they have uh, peer support groups where you and your husband can sit down either privately with a counselor or uh, in a group setting to kind of talk through some of these concerns or issues with a third party. And sometimes having someone else in the room can really be a useful way to navigate that difficult conversation. Thank you for that. Um, the next question coming in, my husband and I already have one child and are now struggling with secondary infertility. His testosterone was slightly low and his sperm count was around 10,000. What causes secondary infertility? Could we conceive naturally again? Sure. So the most common cause of secondary infertility, uh, at least from the male side of things, is what's called a varicocele. So a varicocele is an enlargement of the veins in the scrotum. Uh, it's very similar to um, what some people have of varicose veins that are in their legs. They're enlarged veins that don't drain the blood as well as they're supposed to. And so when a man is coming in and being evaluated for second infertility, that's sort of the most common thing that we find. Varicoceles cause the testicles to be warmer than they prefer. The reason that the testicles sit outside the body in the man is because they actually prefer to be a little bit cooler than body temperature, core body temperature. And the varicoceles prevent the testicles from being as cool as they like. That often can lead to low sperm counts or sperm, poor sperm movement or quality. The good news, though, is that varicoceles can be fixed. And so either with a surgery that a urologist does or with a procedure that an interventional radiologist can perform as well, something called an embolization, those are two really good ways to address a varicocele uh, if, if the man has one, if he has one. Um, on average, uh, both sperm counts and pregnancy rates do improve after fixing a varicocele if one is there, although unfortunately it's sort of no guarantee. Um, and so if your partner has not had his own evaluation here now that you guys are trying to have a second child, um, I'd make sure that he goes in and gets to see a doctor himself as well. Okay. The next question we have is regards to laptops and cell phones. Sure. Uh, a laptop in your lap, a cell phone in your front pocket, would that affect fertility? Sure. So um, I'll talk about the laptop first if sure. I can. So um, laptops are great. We all can be really mobile. We can do work wherever we want, including here in this room. Um, the downside of a laptop is that they uh, have a pretty good battery on the underside and that battery can generate a lot of heat. Mm -hmm. So I recommend to my patients that they not use a laptop directly on their lap. Um, they, uh, at, at, you know, at office stores, you can buy these really nice lap desks uh, that you can put on top of your lap and then put the laptop on top of that. It keeps the heat of the battery away from the groin in the man um, or put it, as you're doing here today, on the table. So using a laptop on a table, no problem at all. Putting it directly on the lap, probably not a great okay. idea. It's the heat that's the main issue. <clears throat> um, for the cell phones, you know, people have tried to kind of look at this as well and, and, and understand are there any issues with the, the electromagnetic kind of radiation that mm -hmm. comes from a cell phone. The good news is that probably not. Um, it is still a, a little bit of an ongoing area of research to try and make sure we truly have the right answers. But uh, I think it's, at least from the research I've seen, it's unlikely that it has a significant or big effect. It's good to know, good to know. The next question coming in, are boxes or briefs better from a fertility perspective? Yeah, so I just talked a little bit about kind of heat yes, and that thing, so it's a natural question, right? So people ask this all the time. Some people have actually have looked at this. They've done surveys of couples that are trying to get pregnant, and uh, one of the many, many questions that they ask the couples is, does your partner or do you wear boxers or briefs? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't look like it has a big difference in terms of time to pregnancy. So um, a natural question, a logical assumption, but the good news is wear what's comfortable. Okay, great answer. Now the, the next uh, question is with regards to hot tubs and yeah. fertility. Sure. Hot tubs are bad. So um, they're a lot of fun. If you go skiing or have a cool summer evening and want to sit in a hot tub, it can feel really great, but the bad news is that it's not good for your sperm. And so I talked earlier about heat, and it's truly a sort of the immersive wet heat that you get in a hot tub that can be very bad for sperm. Some, and this is not a reliable means of contraception, but some people have used hot tubs or things like that wow. as to try and, uh, you know, lower their sperm count on purpose. Um, wow. Most people, it's accidental. Um, and so uh, I tell guys to avoid hot tubs. I also tell guys to avoid saunas. 
Um, even though they're not underwater, it's still a very immersive wet heat in a sauna, mm -hmm. usually a pretty high temperature as well. So I tell guys, no hot tubs, no saunas while you're trying to get pregnant. Um, here in the Midwest, it's, we have pretty cold winters. The good news is that showers are fine. So you can still take a hot shower if you want and not worry about hurting the sperm. Okay, so we're, we're, we're you know, busting some myths and we're confirming yeah. some things here. So we have laptops, cell phones, boxes, briefs, hot tubs. The next question, bike riding, riding a bike. So exercise is good. And I think um, my wife likes to use the phrase a lot, that, you know, everything in moderation, including moderation. And so I would say moderate amount of, of bike riding is fine. Um, and moderate amount of exercise is actually encouraged for guys. Um, the sort of very common phrase I use with guys is, gonna, you know, what's good for your body is going to be good for your sperm. And so um, moderate amount of exercise is fine. Um, they have looked at at least what I would consider sort of more extreme amounts of exercise, mm -hmm. um, things like marathons. You could probably put very long bike rides into that category. And extreme amounts of exercise look like they are not good for your fertility. Okay. So I tell guys to avoid, you know, training for a marathon in this in about bike riding, I would say, you know, casual, moderate amounts of bike riding is fine, um, but maybe don't go, you know, planning for the Tour de France or anything like that yeah. while you're trying to get pregnant. Excellent answer. Then the next question we have, and this is an interesting one. I am a 35-year-old male, and we've been trying for a baby for about six months. Okay. I had some groin injuries in college playing baseball. Should I be worried? Yeah, and, and you know, sports injuries are really common um, in men. Um, some of them, you know, sound like pretty competitive athletes, like the person that asked this question. Um, and sometimes just, you know, kids just get hit in the groin sometimes. Um, I don't think he necessarily needs to be worried right away. I would say um, if he and his partner have been trying, once they reach the point they've been trying for about a year, um, you know, to go in and see a fertility specialist for an evaluation. Um, if he ever required surgery associated with any of those groin injuries, or if he ever, you know, had significant swelling, bruising, uh, bleeding associated with any of those groin injuries, I would be more worried. Um, but if he'd never really required or needed medical attention, then, you know, probably okay for now. But, mm -hmm. you know, after if it's been a couple more months and they haven't conceived, I'd say go see a doctor and get an evaluation. Generally, we recommend that folks uh, get an evaluation if they've been trying for about a year. There are some exceptions, mostly if the female partner is younger. And so if, or excuse me, if the female partner is uh, 35 or older, we will often say if it's been about six months, go in for a fertility evaluation, which it sounds like it's about how long this man has been trying. <clears throat> okay. Uh, next question, pressure, pressure at work. I'm under a lot of pressure at work. Does my stress affect our ability to get pregnant? Maybe. Um, you know, there's been no clear um, research or science to say that uh, to directly connect, you know, pressure at work, pressure at home, and fertility issues, but we do know that um, when people are feeling stress, um, they have higher amounts of a uh, hormone called cortisol in their body, it's sort of a stress hormone. Uh, people um, might also have changes to their testosterone levels associated with stress and fatigue and exhaustion. Testosterone is an important hormone for sperm production and fertility. And um, I often will talk to guys about, you know, how they can manage that stress. This is, again, where, uh, at least in our clinic, we've got some really wonderful uh, counselors that will meet with men or their partners or both of them to talk about stress management because uh, struggles getting, for getting pregnant are stressful enough. Layered on top of stress from work or home, it can be overwhelming sometimes. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it could be impacting both his excitement of getting pregnant, but then it also could, may impact his hormones or his reproductive function as well. Thank you for that, Dr. Dupree. Uh, next up, we have a question. What percent of male infertility is caused by hereditary or genetic issues? I think my dad was diagnosed with low sperm, but I can't remember the details. Sure. So when you look at uh, all men that are coming in for fertility evaluations, about, um, you know, somewhere in the range of sort of 2 to 4% of them are found to have a genetic abnormality as part of that evaluation. Some of those genetic abnormalities they may have inherited from their mother or father. Um, some of them might have shown up for them at, for the very first time. So it's probably on the, on the lower end of that that are truly inheritable, you know, fertility issues that are gathered from, you know, one of the parents. Um, but genetic issues can be, are an important part of our evaluation because we know that genetic issues are a, uh, 
a common f cause of fertility issues in men as well. Great. How often is an infertility issue with a couple caused by male infertility? I think we touched on this earlier, but it bears, bears looking into again. Yeah, and I can provide certainly a little sure. bit more, more detail this time around. So again, when you look at sort of all of the uh, couples that come in for fertility evaluations, um, the man and the woman, and you ask, you know, how common or what sort of the outcomes of that evaluation? How often was it that um, there was something significant with the female partner's reproductive health? How often was it something significant with the male partner's reproductive health or both? Um, and what we know is that about 20 to 30 percent of the time, um, there's something significant found really just with the male partner alone. Um, about another 20 or so percent of the time, there's something significant found for both the male and the female partner, um, so that they both are sort of bringing something to the table that's making it harder to get pregnant. And then about 50 percent of the time, something significant uh, is found for the female partner uh, but not on the male partner side of things. Um, I think that's really an important question. I'm really glad that someone asked that question uh, here today because I think there's sort of a perception in our culture, and, or at least in many parts of our culture and society, that um, infertility issues are, are, are assumed to be a female issue, and mm -hmm. it's just not the case. Um, as I just went through those numbers, about half the time the male partner is contributing either in part or in whole to the couple's issues getting pregnant. Thank you for that. A question about medications. How mm -hmm. do I know if the medications I'm on affect my fertility? Sure. B best thing to do is ask, ask your doctor, mm -hmm. um, either the doctor that's prescribing you those medications or ask for a referral to see a male fertility specialist to talk about some of those medications. Uh, the, list of, the list of all the medicines in the world that can affect fertility is actually pretty long, so it's hard to go through here today. Um, but uh, but it's worth a discussion with, again, both the doctor that's prescribing it and a fertility specialist. Sometimes those medicines are really, really important and can't be changed uh, because of other health issues that are going on. Um, in other situations, there are maybe, you know, related sort of sister medications or cousin medications that could be switched that would have less likely of an impact on uh, fertility. Um, while we're talking about medications, mm -hmm. one of the things that I, I really want to make very clear is that uh, if anyone's taking testosterone, Testosterone is actually very bad for male fertility. Um, that may be a little counterintuitive because I just told you earlier that it's an important hormone within our own bodies. But what we know is that when a man is taking hormone, uh, excuse me, taking testosterone from the outside, either injections or uh, topical creams or gels that he might put on, um, testosterone from outside the body actually lowers the testicles' own production of testosterone lowers the testicles production of sperm and is actually quite bad for fertility. Oh, wow. So that's a really, really important medication uh, for men to know if they're taking that that's really pretty bad for fertility. Thank you. Important information yeah. there. Um, next question. This, this ties into this. Does Viagra or other erectile dysfunction drugs affect male infertility? That's a, a really good question. I think there's a, research that's still being um, uh, done to kind of provide a really definitive answer to that question. Um, there are some times that uh, uh, a, a man might need to take Viagra to be able to have intercourse. And so if the man is taking that Viagra so that he can have intercourse with his partner, so that they can conceive via intercourse, then that Viagra is actually probably pretty important for them to take. Um, some men have erectile dysfunction that prevents them from having intercourse, and of course if you can't have intercourse it's pretty tough to get pregnant and at least mm -hmm. get pregnant naturally. Um, if a man is able to have intercourse without the Viagra, it's probably best to withhold it. There are some smaller research studies that suggested that some of the main active ingredients in things like Viagra and Cialis might impair some of the really advanced functions of the sperm. Um, I don't feel comfortable saying that we have the definitive answer on that. It's sort of an ongoing open question. And so um, if you don't need the Viagra or Cialis, I'd say avoid it. Um, but if, it's a, what, if that drug is what's allowing you to have intercourse, to try and get pregnant, um, then it's worth taking. Okay. And the next question we have, uh, how do caffeine or alcohol affect fertility? So um, I've not seen any good research that says that caffeine has uh, you know, an issue one way or the other. So if you enjoy drinking your coffee, go for it. Again, I think my wife's mantra of everything in moderation, including moderation, is one that you know, applies here as well. Um, the, with alcohol, um, excessive amounts of alcohol, by that I mean more than two or three drinks a day, um, is associated with worse sperm quality and sperm counts. 
Um, but moderate amounts of alcohol, by that I mean, you know, zero, one, maybe two drinks a day, um, does not look like it has a significant impact on fertility in men. Okay, and the next question, this is a little bit of a different one. A uh, couple are trying to conceive. She keeps telling him to stop using marijuana, but he refuses. Uh, she's worried about uh, fertility, about the baby in the long run. What are the effects of, of marijuana? Yeah, so um, uh, she's right to be concerned. Um, and so uh, we know that marijuana, <coughs> uh, and, and actually THC, the active ingredient in marijuana, um, is bad for sperm. And so regardless of whether it is uh, smoked or consumed via edibles or by whatever route, uh, even, va even vaping, which I know is more common lately, uh, we know that THC is bad for sperm. And so I give very clear instructions to my patients that uh, in order to prove the health and the quality of the sperm and improve then the chances of getting pregnant, it's important to stop using marijuana in whatever form. Thank you for that. When trying to improve sperm morphology using supplements, how long should I wait to see if there is an improvement? That's another interesting one. So here it's important to um, sort of talk a little bit about how sperm are made. And so um, the production cycle that takes a sperm from a, a very sort of early single cell until it goes through its, its entire maturation process to be ready to fertilize an egg, it takes around three months, a little bit less than three months. So anytime a man changes something about his lifestyle, his medications, has a surgery, has an injury or an infection, we generally wait at least three months to uh, look for the uh, outcomes or the results in the sperm as a result of that change in lifestyle or medications in this case. Uh, the analogy I like to draw, and again, we're here in Michigan, and so you can think about a car assembly line. Um, so uh, it takes several days for a car to work its way through an assembly line. If they decide to change the way the rear view mirror is installed, you know, you aren't going to see that in the end result until you have the very first car that starts in that assembly line. The cars that are already past that stage are going to still look the same even if you're changing the rear view mirror uh, in your process going forward. So three months. Okay. Okay. Next question we have coming up. Um, what is a normal sperm count? So the World Health Organization um, is the body that defines what we uh, consider a normal sperm count. And um, there are several different factors that we look at when we evaluate a sperm count um, or a sperm sample overall. Um, the count, the way we talk about that is we talk about that in terms of concentration. So we say how many sperm are present within each milliliter, which is a, a measurement of volume, so how many sperm are present within each milliliter of, of uh, semen? The normal amount, at least what the World Health Organization says, is more than 15 million sperm per milliliter of fluid. Now, um, just because a man is above that amount, it doesn't mean that everything is normal. And also, on the flip side, just because a man is below that amount, it does not mean that he is infertile and has no chance of getting pregnant. The way the World Health Organization came up with those numbers is they actually got sperm sample results from really you know, hundreds and thousands of men around the world who all had had proven fertility, who had fathered a child within the past year. They laid out all those results on a graph and they just took the bottom 5% of that graph mm -hmm. and said that men with counts below that number are what we're going to consider low or abnormal. So even in the World Health Organization work that put together those guidelines, um, there are men that have had sperm counts less than 15 million that have fathered a child. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, next question. My husband is overweight with type 2 diabetes. He has never had a sperm count done, but I'm worried that his medical issues are interfering with our ability to become pregnant. We've been trying for four months. What should I do? So the best thing to do, I think there's probably two important things for him to do. One is for him to meet with uh, either his primary care doctor or his endocrinologist, whoever, whoever is that's managing his diabetes, to make sure that his diabetes is as well controlled as possible. So that's kind of, I think, okay. step one. Step two would certainly be for him to come and see uh, a male fertility specialist uh, for an evaluation, just like we talked about at the very top of this session, uh, sort of a discussion, a physical exam, and a sperm count. Once we have a sperm count, we can give him a lot more information about the quality of his sperm and how his medical issues may be impacting things. Um, for people with diabetes, um, and uh, I forget if uh, this question mentioned if the uh, patient was overweight or not, but um, we yeah. okay. So um, uh, we do know that men that are overweight do have lower sperm counts than men that are normal weight, and so one important lifestyle thing that would help 
well, help both his diabetes and probably help his fertility would be to lose weight. I know it's easier said than done, but it's really important. Um, and so both the primary care doctor and the urologist kind of help him figure out how to do that. Um, some men with diabetes can also develop erectile dysfunction that can make it difficult to have intercourse. And so in some cases, um, uh, that can be contributing to a couple's infertility. And that's where medications like Viagra or Cialis that we talked about earlier can be useful. Okay. The next question we have in, and I'm happy to say we still have quite a few questions. Yeah, great. Keep my them coming. <laughs> my husband was diagnosed with low sperm count. He's having a really hard time psychologically and won't really talk to me about it. I'm worried that he's pulling away emotionally. What should I do? She really wants to have a baby. Sure. Um, and, uh, you know, I, again, I take care of a lot of uh, uh, men with fertility issues, and I think this is a very, it's a very common response. And I think that the first thing I would tell you and have you tell your, your husband is that um, it's very common for this diagnosis to throw people for a loop, and that's true of both men that are told they have a low sperm count, women that are told that they have infertility. Um, so this really does kind of throw people for a loop. And, um, you know, researchers have looked at sort of the psychological impact of being told that you, are, you have fertility issues, and um, it's, this may be surprising, but it actually has uh, a similar sort of psychological impact for people being told they have cancer. And so we know that this is a really kind of heavy thing to be told. And so first thing I would do is kind of normalize it for, um, for you, normalize it for your husband, that it's okay to feel shooken up. Um, I would encourage you know, uh, him to see a urologist to kind of talk about what he might be able to do about this. Um, it's important to understand that just because you know, he has a low sperm count, um, it doesn't change anything about his masculinity. It doesn't change anything about his role as a, as a husband. Um, uh, as a sort of man in society, it doesn't change anything about his, you know, role, potential role as a father as well. And um, I mentioned earlier as well that, that a lot of clinics have kind of counselors or therapists that work there. This is a perfect opportunity to connect with them or uh, connect with a peer support group. So there's a national organization called Resolve. Um, Resolve uh, uh, organizes or helps facilitate peer support groups for individuals with infertility in communities around the country. And so uh, I have no affiliation with Resolve, but I encourage patients to go and check out and find a peer support group so that he can have an outlet to kind of talk about, you know, what he's experiencing. Okay. And, and the next question kind of dovetails with that. What are some treatment options for men with a low sperm count? Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of that's going to depend on, on why his sperm count may be low. So if it's a hormonal issue, the good news is, is there's medications we can prescribe him uh, that will hopefully improve his hormones for... Um, uh, uh, for better production of sperm. Uh, if it is an anatomic issue, for example, if he has varicoceles like we talked about earlier, there are surgeries uh, or procedures, radiology procedures that can be done uh, to fix the varicoceles to improve the sperm count. Uh, if it's a lifestyle thing, for example, if he's using marijuana, if he's smoking, if he's overweight, if he uh, sits in the hot tub all day, um, he should really refrain from those, change his lifestyle, and Again, the hope is that you know three, four months later that they would see improvements in the sperm count. So there's definitely things that can be done. The dye is not cast. Um, I have to admit, though, that there are times that we try all those things, and it's very frustrating for patients, and it's certainly frustrating for me as their doctor, um, that we try all of the above, and the sperm count can still be low. The good news is that even if the sperm count is low, there's really great technologies that are available to, so that you know he can still father a child, you can still mother a child, and that includes things like artificial insemination, like we talked about earlier, that can be useful with a low sperm count. Um, or it can, um, uh, things like in vitro fertilization, IVF, or IVF with ICSI, like we talked about at the very beginning. Okay, thank you for that. The next question we have, will abstaining from sex help my sperm count rise back up? Yeah, so um, the, there actually is a relationship between uh, abstinence and a lot of the numbers that we look at when we evaluate a sperm uh, test. When we do a sperm count test, we tell men generally to be abstinent for two to three days before the test. And that's because uh, the longer a man goes with abstinence, um, his sperm count may go up some, but his motility or movement of the sperm will often go down. And so, um, the sperm with frequent ejaculations, uh, you can consider it fresher. The sperm are more active and mobile, uh, but the counts are often a little bit lower. So two to three days is kind of the sweet spot where we ask guys to 
have you know that amount of abstinence before we do the test. That way we can compare appropriately how you know his numbers compared to other men. Okay. Next question: How do STDs affect male fertility? So STDs can affect male fertility in a couple different ways. Um, some STDs can cause uh, uh, inflammation or infection that causes scarring, scarring that blocks the tubes that the sperm normally flow through. Um, and so if a man ever has an STD, it's obviously important that he gets it treated and gets it treated appropriately and quickly. Um, if a man has a history of STDs in the past, even if they've been treated, um, that's an important thing to mention to your doctor during your evaluation because based off of uh, that part of the history, you know, your doctor may do some additional tests for you, uh, including you know, making sure that uh, he or she is examining the testicles to feel for any signs of blockage that can impact things. Um, some STDs as well can also be passed on to partners um, during sexual activity. And so for people that have, for example, HIV, the HIV virus, um, it's important to talk with your doctors about your plans to get pregnant because there's things that, um, that your doctors can do that help um, you know, minimize the risk of HIV being transmitted to the female partner and then also to the baby or offspring. Okay. Next question, are there certain sex positions that are better for getting pregnant? Um, so the short answer is no. So really just whatever sex positions are going to be comfortable for you and your partner um, are fine. Um, there I think are some old uh, 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 sort of myths about uh, the woman needing to lay on her back with her pelvis tilted up in the air for a certain amount number of minutes afterwards. Um, I don't know if it's good news or not, uh, but that probably doesn't matter. Um, and so uh, I would say whatever sex position is comfortable for the couple that you enjoy. Um, again, sex can sometimes start to feel, um, <laughs> sometimes it can start to feel like work instead mm -hmm. of like an enjoyable part of the relationship during these fertility, uh, uh, if people are having infertility. And so I try and... Um, I try and avoid being prescriptive about that mm -hmm. so that couples can just do whatever kind of feels natural and comfortable for them. Okay, okay. Next question we have, what type of lubricant should we use if we're trying to get pregnant? Yeah, so the, the best lubricant to use is just the, the fluids that your genitals make. Um, those are, are natural lubricants that are, uh, have no negative impacts on sperm or on fertility. So the best thing to do is just use the fluids your genitals make. Um, saliva is actually bad for sperm, so we advise couples not to use saliva when they're having intercourse. Um, if sex is uncomfortable, though, um, there are some lubricants that are better for sperm than others. There are some things that actually you can just find around the house that are usually pretty readily at hand, things like vegetable oil, vegetable oil and canola oil that are found to be neutral for sperm, and so um, there's really uh, uh, should not be any negative impact for sperm there. Um, there's one commercial product, at least that I know of, that's been tested, one called Preseed. Um, it is, again, neutral for sperm. Um, it's not a sperm booster in any way, but it is one that, again, if sex is uncomfortable, is, one, uh, is a lubricant that would be fine to use. Many of the other commercial lubricants that are out there um, do have chemicals in them that are bad for sperm, in particular the movement of sperm. So I advise couples to avoid any of the kind of remaining commercial products. Okay, and the next question we have up, does masturbation help or hurt the cause? Um, yeah, wow, that's a great question. Um, so I, I think it probably depends on the individual couple and the individual man in terms of sort of why he's asking. Um, uh, you know, obviously the basis here is that, you know, to get pregnant, the sperm need to make their way to where the egg is. Um, and the most efficient way to get the sperm to where the egg is, is with intercourse, vaginal intercourse. Um, so masturbation doesn't really help accomplish that goal. But, um, you know, given, depending on the man situation, if he finds at all that masturbation is getting in the way of him, you know, being able to have a regular erection or reliable intercourse with his partner, then the masturbation may be, may be hurting his cause. Okay. Um, so again, it's very kind of dependent on the individual situation. Okay. Next question, can you tell me how Zika affects sperm? Well, yeah, um, you know, that topic got a lot of attention over the past probably one to two years, I would say. Um, Zika looks like it is um, uh, a sexually, can be a sexually transmitted virus. Um, and as you've probably seen on sort of the news or in the newspapers, uh, the Zika virus can affect the health of the offspring. So Zika is found in the semen of men, men that have been exposed to the virus in the past. 
Um, the CDC, um, uh, the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, uh, has put out recommendations about kind of Zika, uh, protecting against Zika and reproduction. The American Society of Reproductive Medicine has also put out recommendations on this. So in terms of what I tell my male partners, so, um, and this is going to be a little complicated, so stop me along the way if it is. So um, if a couple knows that they're going to try and get pregnant, um, I tell them to, well, tell him, the male partner, you know, to avoid travel to known Zika-infected areas. If they're looking for a pregnancy, certainly within the next six months, but maybe even in the next year to be safe. So avoid travel to that area if you can. If he can't avoid travel to that area, then make sure that he takes you know, all the right precautions to avoid mosquito bites, because Zika is transmitted through mosquitoes. Um, if a man has traveled to a Zika-infected area, we recommend that he use barrier contraception, so condoms, through intercourse with his partner for six months. So for six months after travel to a Zika-infected area, or six months after having signs or symptoms of Zika, it is possible that he could still transmit that uh, virus to his female partner. So um, I guess the short answer is avoid travel if you can. If you can't, when you return, uh, use barrier contraception condoms for six months. Okay, thank you. Thank you yeah. for that. Uh, so the next thing, um, let's recap again some of the exercises, the diet, the vitamin tips, vitamin tips that can help male fertility. Sure. So um, again, exercise, uh, the easiest thing to remember is if it's good for your body, it's going to be good for your sperm. And I, I think we all know that exercise is good for our bodies. Again, a moderate amount of exercise is encouraged. Um, what I mean by that, you know, 30 to 60 minutes of exercise, four to five days a week, that's ideal. Um, I often fall short in that, but, you know, I think that's something, a good goal for all of us to strive for, uh, for our overall health, but it's also good for fertility. Extreme amounts of exercise uh, are, I discourage men because they can actually lower reproductive health and lower sperm counts. In terms of diet, again, a healthy, balanced diet, plenty of fruits and vegetables, green leafy vegetables in particular. Maintaining a healthy body weight, losing weight for men that are overweight is important from a lifestyle perspective. No, no supplements are required or needed. Um, if guys really strongly feel that they want to take a supplement, I tell guys to consider zinc, vitamin C, and, uh, and coenzyme Q10. Okay. And um, one other recap topic. Let's, let's recap what, at what age does male infertility decrease? Does male age impact potential birth defects like female age does? Yeah, so... Um, uh, again, this is sort of an active, an area of active research. So I think this is one of those parts of medicine where in five years, if you ask me the same question, I might have a different answer for you. Um, it looks like as men start to get into their sort of 50s, 60s, and 70s, that there is probably a decline in sperm count and quality and an ever so slight increase in the risk of birth defects as men get into those older age. The overall birth defect rate is still low, so it's not like a man in his 50s or 60s is guaranteed to have a child with a birth defect. Um, but it is probably an increased risk compared to a man in his, you know, 20s or 30s. Okay. And before we wrap up, Dr. Dupree, do you think there's anything we missed? Is there anything that you'd like to touch on? Yeah, no, I mean, this is a great series of questions. So thank you for all of you that have submitted questions today. Um, uh, you know, this is a part of our field that I feel very passionate about, and I really appreciate everyone having a chance to, to ask these questions. I think probably the, the number one thing I'd want people to remember going home is that, you know, uh, male infertility is actually a more common issue than I think many of us perceive. Um, that um, urologists that you would see are, uh, tend, to be a pretty, um, tend to be a pretty friendly bunch, and so going in for an evaluation is something that I hope men would not be worried or nervous about. Um, and that, you know, if a man is having fertility issues, there's a lot of things that we can do to understand why that might be occurring. Um, and hopefully help them have a pregnancy. Um, the last thing I always tell guys is that, you know, there's a lot of ways to be a father and a lot of ways to build a family. There are some patients that I see that, um, unfortunately, there is sort of no way for us to have sperm from him. And so there are other ways to build a family, such as using sperm from donors or using adoption. And people could still have great families and, great, and be great fathers um, using donor sperm and, and uh, adoption. There's a lot of great families out there of all different types. Well, we're, we're closing in on our time now. Great. Thank you for these answers. Thank you for your time and your expertise, Dr. Yes, my Dupree. Pleasure. Um, I'll, Dr. Dupree sees patients at our Center for Reproductive Medicine at Briarwood in Ann Arbor. So to make an appointment with him or one of his colleagues, you can call 734-936-2000.
7030. Now we'll put that up on in the Facebook comments too. You can ask for an appointment with a male fertility specialist. Information about their clinics and any of our programs and clinics is available at uofmhealth.org. We have one additional fertility chat coming up. Next month we're going to be talking about egg freezing and how to determine if that's an option for you. So you can watch last month's Fertility 101 web chat and find a recording of today's chat starting tomorrow at uofmhealth.org slash online chats. And thank you to our audience as well. Um, all of these uh, questions have been fantastic. Thank you for answering these. Uh, thank you for spending part of your afternoon with us. We hope today's chat has been helpful. We have a brief survey we've prepared to help us learn how we can make chats like today's more helpful to you and to help us identify more topics you'd like to hear about in the future. So if you registered in advance, you'll receive an email with the link or you can check the comments on this video and we'll have a link there for you to follow. So once again, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Dupree. This was great. Have a good afternoon. Take care.